Okay, so let us get into now a discussion about bomb calorimetry, right? So we talked about calorimetry before. We talked about the low-tech version where we use a coffee cup or two styrofoam cups. But in the case of the bomb calorimeter, we use this generally to measure the enthalpy change for the combustion of organic substances. And um, we talked about it before. If you remember, this is the original setup. Let me go to the full screen here. Okay, so this is the setup here. This is a schematic representation of what is involved. And one key thing that you need to remember about this particular setup is that it is designed to carry out a reaction under constant volume conditions. And if you recall, we said that if the reaction occurs under constant volume conditions, then basically the enthalpy change would be due to the change in internal energy of the system. So in this particular case, the enthalpy of reaction, um, if you put a minus sign in front of that, that would be equal to the enthalpy of the calorimeter. If you remember, we said whatever the heat that is absorbed by the calorimeter, it's due to the heat that is produced by the reaction. So that's the reason why we have a negative sign here. And as a result, delta U would be equal to all of that because the heat change under constant volume conditions um, would be equal to delta U. Even though that's the case, in many cases, the value of delta U is a good approximation of delta H. All right. So basically, um, that's basically how we determine the enthalpy change of a combustion reaction using the bomb calorimeter. Okay, so now we're going to get into a discussion of a very important law. Very important because it's very useful for calculating the enthalpy changes of reactions that we cannot actually measure experimentally. Now this law is called Hess's law of constant summation. And we would use this law conveniently to solve a problem such as determining the enthalpy change of this reaction, carbon reacting with oxygen to form carbon monoxide. Now, in practice, this reaction is very difficult to carry out because for one, not only do you have this reaction taking place, but you can also have a further reaction of the carbon monoxide reacting with more oxygen to form carbon dioxide, right? So if that reaction takes place, that complicates things a bit because um, we're only interested in determining this reaction right here, the enthalpy change of this reaction. Another intervening reaction would affect the experimental conditions that would allow us to um, correctly determine the enthalpy change of this reaction of interest. Another possibility is that even if we have everything correct here, you might still have some carbon left over, right? So that's another complication which would prevent us from determining the enthalpy change of this reaction. However, due to Hess's law, um, which is based on the fact that enthalpy change is a state function, um, what this means basically is that the enthalpy change of the reaction is the same whether or not the reaction is carried out in one step or through a number of steps. So this is where Hess's law comes into play. Basically what Hess's law says is that if you have an equation that can be expressed as the sum of two or more equations, then the enthalpy change for the initial equation is the sum of the enthalpy changes of all the other equations, all right? So basically, um, let me just go to a blank page um, here. Let me, um, uh, I'm sorry, let me insert a blank slide here. Let me just clear this out so that I can explain hypothetically what I'm talking about here. Okay, so, um, so if you have, let's say, a reaction A going to C, right? And let's say that the enthalpy change for that is delta H3, right? And let's say you can also get to C by A being converted to an intermediate B, and then B reacts eventually to form C. And let's say this has a value of delta H1 for the enthalpy change going from A to B, 
and let's say this is delta H2. Well, according to Hess's law, delta H3 will be equal to delta H2 plus delta H1, delta H1, all right? So basically what Hess's law is saying is that the enthalpy change going directly from A to C would be equal to the sum of the enthalpy changes going from A to B and then B to C, all right? So therefore, if you can somehow figure out, or if you know what this is, and let's say you know what this is, then you can easily calculate what delta H2 is, right? So that's basically what is involved in Hess's law. Now let me give you a real example of this law at work. Um, going back to the carbon monoxide example right here. Let me scroll down to the next page. So here we have a diagram which shows you um, what happens when you react carbon and oxygen. Now, carbon and oxygen can combine to form carbon dioxide. So that can go in one reaction as shown by this arrow here. And if you were to carry out this reaction and measure or calculate the enthalpy change, <coughs> excuse me, you see that that is equal to minus 393.5 kilojoules. Um, but you can also have the reaction taking place in two steps where carbon reacts with half a mole of oxygen to form carbon monoxide and then the carbon monoxide reacts with a half a mole of oxygen more to form carbon dioxide. So therefore you have two steps with two separate enthalpy changes. So therefore according to Hess's law, the sum of the enthalpy changes represented by delta HA and delta HB here would be equal to the enthalpy change of the reaction going straight from the carbon and oxygen to carbon dioxide which is represented by delta HC, right? And therefore, as I said before, because of the practical difficulties in determining delta HA, which is, I'm sorry, which is the enthalpy change for the formation of carbon monoxide, we can use this value and this value to easily calculate this because these two, when you add them up, is equal to delta HC. So that's basically how Hess's law works. So if we were to do the actual math, let me do this here. If we were to do the actual math, then um, delta H A would be equal to delta H C minus delta H B, which would be equal to minus 393.5 kilojoules minus minus 28, I'm sorry, 283.0 kilojoules. And let me do this on my calculator. So when I do minus 393.5 minus minus 283.0, um, the answer I get here is minus 11, I'm sorry, minus 110, minus 110.5 kilojoules. And that's basically how that is done, all right? Now, this is admittedly a relatively simple example. There are other examples, problems, that are a bit more complicated, such as this one right here. And um, so I'm gonna go through this example right here so that, and this is, by the way, typical of a problem of this type, an enthalpy, Hess's law type problem. So let me explain what's happening here. So the question says you're to calculate the enthalpy change for this reaction here, right? So delta H is what you're trying to find for this reaction. And it gives you information about other related reactions and their corresponding enthalpy changes, right? So basically what this question is saying is that you're to use the information from B, C, and D to determine the enthalpy change for the reaction represented in A, all right? Okay, so this is how we are gonna go about doing this. So what we need to do is first compare each equation with um, the initial or the equation that you're trying to find delta H of. So if you compare equation B 
right? This is equation B here. To A, you'll notice that what they have in common is that you have carbon on the left side. But one difference is that in the in equation A, you have two as the coefficient here, and in equation B, you have only one. So what we're, I'm going to do is basically multiply this equation here by two so that I end up with a coefficient of two right here. But remember, in doing that, you need to multiply the delta H value here given by two as well, because remember, enthalpy is extensive. It is dependent on the amount of substances involved in the reaction. So when you multiply that equation by two, you're going to end up with two carbons, solid, plus O2 gas, two O2 gas to give you two CO2. And the delta H value for that will be equal to two times minus three, nine, three point five kilojoules. All right. Okay. The next step is to compare equation C with equation A. And what do we notice that they have in common? Well, they do have C2H4 in common here and here. But the difference is the C2H4 in C is on the left side of the equation, but the C2H4 in A is on the right side of the equation. So what I'm going to do is flip this equation so that the C2H4 ends up on the right side. But if we do that, we have to change the sign of the enthalpy change for that equation from negative to positive, right? So if we flip it, we're going to end up with 2CO2 gas plus 2H2O liquid to give C2H4 gas plus 3O2 gas. And therefore, delta H for that would be equal to positive 1410.9 kilojoules. All right? Okay, finally, we get to equation D and we compare it to equation A. And what do we notice? We notice that what they have in common is H2 here and H2 here. But the difference again is that there's a coefficient of 2 here in the case of A, where um, H2 has that coefficient of 2, and here the coefficient for H2 is 1. So as we did in the case of B, what we're going to do is multiply this equation here by 2, and when we do that, you're going to end up with 2H2 gas plus O2 to give 2H2O liquid and delta H for that will be equal to 2 times minus 285.8 kilojoules. All right. Okay, so now that we have done that, the next step is that we add up all these equations together. And when we do that, of course, we have had some experience with that before um, in terms of adding equations together. When you're doing that, you need to cancel out those items that are common to opposite sides, right? So first thing I notice here is that these two carbon dioxides will cancel out with these two carbon dioxides. These two H2O will cancel out with two water here. And this might not be obvious, but the oxygens cancel out because you have a total of two plus one, three oxygens and on the left side, and you have a total of three oxygens here on the right side. So you're going to end up with these two and this one canceling out with these three oxygens, right? Um, and then there's nothing else left to cancel out, so we simply write down what is left. So what is left would be on the left side, we have two carbon solids plus two H2 gas to give C2H4 gas, which turns out to be the same as the equation for which we're trying to find delta H. So how do we find that delta H value? Well, as soon as I can find my, okay. 
the delta H value for that reaction would be the sum of the delta H values that we have here, here, and here, all right? So, again, we have to do our number crunching, starting with the 2 times minus 393.5, and then I would add to that 141.0.9, and then I would add to that 2 times 285.8 minus. So according to my calculations, the final delta H value that you're going to end up with here is 52.3 kilojoules. All right. So that's basically how that is done. And as I said before, this problem is very typical of the type of problem that you'll get um, as far as Hess's law problems are concerned, all right? Okay, so um, let's move on now to a discussion of enthalpies of formation. And um, what do we mean by this? Well, firstly, um, to calculate the actual definition of delta H, we said this before. The actual definition of the enthalpy change of reaction is the sum of the enthalpy of products minus the sum of enthalpy of reactants. But there's one problem with this in terms of practical usage, and that is that we can never know the absolute values of the enthalpy of anything, right? So therefore, we have to use a relative scale, all right? So how do we determine that relative scale? Well, in order for us to do that, we have to define what is known as a standard state of a substance, right? And by definition, and this is adopted universally in chemistry, the standard state of a substance is the state of that pure substance under the conditions of one atmosphere pressure for gases and the temperature being 25 degrees Celsius, right? So therefore, the standard conditions for us to determine or define the standard state would be one atmosphere pressure and 25 degrees Celsius. Now, please do not confuse this with STP, right? I know this is sounding very similar, but this is not the same thing as standard temperature and pressure. So let me just, for emphasis, say here, not STP, right? STP conditions, those standard conditions apply only to gases. So let me just add STP, let me scratch this out here, STP applies only, only to gases, right? So when we're talking about standard conditions for enthalpy measurements, for standard enthalpy measurements, we're talking about the pressure being one atmosphere and the temperature is being 25 degrees. STP says temperature is zero Kelvin and the pressure is one atmosphere. But for standard state conditions, for the purposes of enthalpy um, standard values. Um, we don't use STP, we use one atmosphere and um, 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so um, this brings us to the definition of the standard enthalpy change, right? Which is what we use um, ultimately to calculate on paper at least the enthalpy of reaction. Um, the standard enthalpy change for reaction is the enthalpy change in which the reactants and products are in their standard states. Now remember, the standard states would be the state of the substance under these conditions, one atmosphere, pressure, and 25 degrees Celsius. And then we get to the standard enthalpy of formation. Now the standard enthalpy of formation for a substance is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a substance is formed from its component elements in their standard states. So basically what we're talking about here is the enthalpy of the formation of one mole of the compound, right, from its constituent elements under the standard conditions that we talked about earlier, all right? Um, so for example, let me just go back to um, this right here. So for example, let me do this and let me, um, 
Okay, why is it eraser? Anyway, um, don't need to erase this. Okay, so for example, let's say I'm just going to use a simple example of water. Let's say you want to find the enthalpy, standard enthalpy of formation of H2O liquid, right? So, as you can see from the formula, obviously water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. So, therefore, the equation for the formation of one mole of hydrogen, I'm sorry, one mole of water would be H2 gas plus half O2 gas, all right? Now, you might be wondering, why do I bother with leaving this coefficient a half? And that's because for the purposes of determining the enthalpy of formation under standard conditions, we have to maintain the fact that we're forming one mole of water, which means that we have to alter these coefficients so that ultimately one mole of the product is formed. So basically, um, under standard conditions, and by the way, this is what this means, this O as a superscript, that indicates standard conditions, standard conditions, all right? So whatever that value is, that would be the standard enthalpy of formation of water, right? Just to use another example, one that's more complicated. Let's say you're trying to determine the standard enthalpy of formation of this compound, which is known as benzene, all right? Well, in this case here, again, we have to make sure that this is fixed at one. The coefficient here is fixed at one, which means that in order for this compound to be formed from its constituent elements, carbon and hydrogen, you're going to have six carbon plus three H2 gas, all right? And whatever the enthalpy of formation, okay, why is this thing, what's going on here? Okay, so again, the enthalpy of formation under standard conditions would be whatever this gives in kilojoules usually, kilojoules per mole, um, would be for this particular reaction, all right? So that's basically how we define the enthalpy of formation of any substance. Now, one more thing before we leave this particular slide here. When it comes to elements, right, in their natural um, state, so let me choose an example. Um, so a simple example like oxygen, right? O2 gas, right? Well, O2 exists as, well, oxygen exists as O2 in nature. So basically, according to the definition of enthalpy of formation, um, if you're looking at oxygen being formed from its elements, which is O2 again, right? Well, that means that in this case, the enthalpy of formation is obviously zero because there's no reaction taking place, right? So therefore, for any element in their natural state under standard conditions, the enthalpy of formation is equal to zero, all right? Now, there are actually tables that have been put together, and um, I think I've made one available in Canvas. Um, let me see if I can bring it up. Um, okay. I thought I had everything ready, but I guess I didn't. So let me go to... Okay, what I'm going to do is go to your page, go to the page for this course, and go to files, and then go to tables. And then you'll notice here, this link here, which says thermodynamic data. So it's several pages, eight pages long. Um, so, so the you'll see that there are three columns for each of these substances, right? The column that we'll be concerned with is the first column right here, right? That contains the enthalpy of formation expressed in kilojoules per mole
for different substances, right? So for example, if I were to pick an arbitrary example, the enthalpy of formation for arsenic sulfide is minus 169.0 kilojoules per mole. If I scroll down further and I choose calcium hydroxide solid, its value is minus 986.09 um, kilojoules per mole. And you'll notice that in the case of the aqueous calcium hydroxide, its value is different. And this is the reason why I said when it comes to these things, you have to include the state symbols because as you can see here clearly, the values can change according to the state of the substance. Um, for example, if you look at water, right? H2O liquid, H2O gas, these are the values, all right? Clearly, the state of the substance is important in terms of um, the enthalpy of formation values under standard conditions. Um, another thing I wanna highlight is something I said earlier. All elements have their enthalpy of formation being equal to zero. So carbon in the form of graphite is zero, cesium is zero, chlorine Cl2 is zero, copper is zero, and so on and so forth. So basically, you don't even have to look up these values. You can basically um, assume that those values are zero for those elements that exist in their natural states. All right, so, um, so here's another example, methanol. Um, being formed from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Again, you see that the equation is set up for the formation of one mole of methanol, and it turns out that in the case of methanol, its enthalpy of formation is given here, minus 238.7 kilojoules under the standard conditions of 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, all right? Um, so since we can um, make these measurements and determine these values under a set um, of conditions, we can treat these values as if they're absolute enthalpies, even though we know they're not, but we can treat them as absolute enthalpy values. And that's where, that's a utility of the table of values um, that I showed you earlier, all right? Um, okay, now this is just asking a question that we answered before. It says, what is the enthalpy of formation of an element in a standard um, state? And as I said before, that would be zero, right? Because um, when an element is formed from itself, there's no reaction taking place. So therefore, the enthalpy of formation of elements in their natural state is zero. Okay, now, how do we calculate the enthalpies of reactions based on these values that you'd find in the table? Well, it comes down to using this equation right here. The enthalpy of the reaction would be the sum of the enthalpy of formation of products minus the sum of the enthalpy of formation of reactants. Now, some explanation is required here. I don't know if you're familiar with this sign right here. It's a Greek letter, um, capital sigma. Um, in math, it is used to represent sum, right? So whenever you see anything that comes after that symbol, it means sum of that particular quantity, all right? So this means sum of the enthalpy of formation of products minus sum of the enthalpy of formation of reactants. Another thing I want to point out here is the symbol nu, right? Nu basically represents the coefficient of the substances involved in the reaction, right? So what this means, therefore, is that before you sum these values up, you have to multiply the enthalpy of formation of each of these substances by their respective coefficients. And then you sum them up, and then you find the difference between the values for the products and the values for the reactants. Remember, it's always products minus reactants when it comes to finding delta H, all right? Um, and this is much easier to use, as stated here, than use, uh, using Hess's law. Hess's law could be used to carry out these calculations, but that would be far more complicated uh, all we have to do is sum up the enthalpy of the formation of the products, subtract from that the sum of the enthalpy of formation of reactants, and that will give you the enthalpy of the reaction under standard conditions, right? So here's an example, right? You're given this balanced equation here, and you're asked for the enthalpy of the reaction under standard conditions, and you're to use the values from the table, okay? Um, so let me um, let me um, 
How should I do this? Okay, let me go to this. No, not this, I'm sorry. Let me go to the table. Where is the table? Um, okay, what I'm gonna do is, now this might be a bit tedious. Um, okay, I think I know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to, draw some arrows here, which should make life a little bit easier. Carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and H2, okay. And what I'm gonna do is, look up the values for each of these, starting with methane. Now, the thing about this table, that I should have mentioned, I think, is that they divide this document into two parts. One part for inorganic compounds and then this table here for organic compounds. Methane is an organic compound. And in this table here, the enthalpy of formation is given right here, which is minus 74.81. So for methane, it's minus 74. Um, minus 74.81 kilojoules per mole. In the case of water, so let me scroll back up. Water, hydrogen, 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 okay. And um, I think it says water in the liquid state. So in the case of H2O liquid, that's minus 285.83. So I'm going to put for here. Minus 285.83 kilojoules per mole. And then in the case of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide where are you carbon dioxide gas minus 393.51 minus 393.51 kilojoules per mole and then in the case of carbon monoxide, that's minus 110.53. Whoops. Uh, minus 110.53 kilojoules per mole. And then in the case of hydrogen, I don't have to look that up because hydrogen is an element by itself, exists as H2 in its natural state, so therefore that is zero kilojoules per mole, all right? Okay, so what is delta H for the reaction? Delta H for the reaction under standard conditions would be equal to the sum of the enthalpy of the products, which is minus 110.53 kilojoules per mole plus zero, so those are the products, minus the sum of the enthalpy under standard conditions for the reactants, which would be minus 74.81 kilojoules plus minus 285.83 kilojoules per mole. Plus, Minus three, what was it? Nine three point five one kilojoules per mole. Let me just confirm that just to make sure because I my pen is up. Um, that is for carbon dioxide. 
Right, okay. So that is correct. And um, all I have to do is number crunching. Let's go back to this. Okay, so let's see here. Um, let me work out, well, let me do this first. Firstly, this here, just to simplify things, would be minus 110.53 kilojoules per mole, okay? And then minus 74.81 minus plus 285.83 minus plus 393.51 minus okay so minus for this part here this will be minus um 754.81 5 kilojoules per mole so when we work this out, according to my calculations, um, this works out to be equal to six four three point six two kilojoules per mole. And that is how that is done. All right. And again, this is a typical problem involving standard enthalpies of formation. Okay, now the last example I'm going to leave for you to do, it's basically very similar to what we just did. Um, the only difference is that in this case, they gave us the enthalpy of the reaction and you're asked to find the enthalpy of formation of this compound here, which is isopropyl alcohol, all right? Um, oxygen will have a value of zero because it's O2, and these two um, are in the table, which we used in the previous example. So I'm gonna leave that for you to try on your own. If you have any issues with that, uh, feel free to contact me concerning solving this problem. Okay, so that's basically it for this chapter. So. Um, the next video will be based on chapter 7, um, so that's it for now.